Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer podcast. We are on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Be sure to subscribe on my YouTube channel and click the notification icon. And if you're on iTunes, please go subscribe and leave a sexy or creepy review on there. I will be reading the best or worst reviews every single week so long as they are five stars. Uh, I'm so excited to have uh, this guy on the podcast today. He is the Libertarian Party 2020 Vice Presidential candidate. He is running uh, right now with Joe Jorgensen. He hosts the My Fellow Americans podcast and also co-hosts the Muddied Waters of Freedom podcast. Spike Cohen, welcome to the program. Hey, Chrissy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. And I, oh, look at you. You're so official with your, your tags right on the side there. <laughs> you're lo- if you're on YouTube, you can see him. But if you're not, it, he has these really great graphics that say, follow him on Twitter at Real Spike Cohen and Facebook, literally Spike Cohen. Yeah, Facebook.com <laughs> slash literally Spike Cohen. I love that. It's like you had a millennial write your, uh, your Facebook page. Well, that, <laughs> like- So that's part of my intro on my show. I say, welcome to my fellow Americans. I am literally Spike Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. The first episode I had was live. I had no business doing the show without practicing first. I'm on there. I'm like, hi. And I said, I'm literally Spike Cohen. And it stuck. Oh and I've been saying it gosh. ever since. So yeah, that's, that that's is... my catchphrase. Literally Spike Cohen. You're like, I am literally shaking right now. <laughs> I'm just making <laughs> a much. martini. That's all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So Spike, you have recently uh, come under fire. People, I guess, saw some shirtless photos of you oh, that yes, you Nipplegate. had on your social media accounts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why the heat for being shirtless? Thank you. So here is where this originally started. I got the nomination and a lot of people in the party didn't know who I was. The delegates knew because they had been closely following it, but but just, you know, I guess kind of casual libertarians didn't know because what I do with Muddy Waters Media is spread the liberty message well outside of libertarian circles. I don't want to be a libertarian show. I am now because all the libertarians watch me, but we want we wanted our shows to be topical and entertaining shows to bring people into libertarianism. There are plenty of, 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 of podcasts and shows doing a terrific job of, you know, iron shopper, sharpening iron, messaging out to existing libertarians. We wanted to bring in people who had never even heard of such a thing. So because of that, I wasn't as well known as some other, you know, more prominent libertarian podcasters. And so people are now tuning in and finding out what I'm about. And one of the, th- one of the things they saw was my profile picture on my personal profile was of me lying down at the beach in the water. And I don't have a shirt on because I'm in the water at the beach. Was it muddy water or just beach water? (laughs) Ah, well, it's sandy water. But yeah, I mean, I guess if it were at a lake, it would have been muddy water. But so, you know, I'm in the water, I'm at the beach and they're outraged. I can see this man's nipples. I am disgusted. How can we ever vote for someone who once took his shirt off at the beach? How can we vote for somebody who has nipples? How can you vote for a man who has nipples? It might be (laughs) nipple envy. I don't want to say it's nipple envy, but it might have been. And so, you know... And, and, and I, I was kind of surprised by it. And so I went on to a friend's comedy podcast, two friends, the Chris and Jesse show with Jesse and Chris. That's what the show is called. And uh, <laughs> so I was on the show and, um, you know, we had, I had the idea, you know, uh, I, I would start with a fully buttoned up shirt and it would pan to them and they would ask a question. And while that was happening, I'd unbutton a shirt. So when they came back to me, there was one button down. And that kept happening with each question until eventually all the buttons were off. And then I just took the shirt off. So that's what people saw. And now meanwhile, and so the joke was we stayed perfectly serious the whole time. I, I, and then at some point I put a stuffed narwhal on my shoulder too. No context at all. Was it almost and, like with each button, like that was a reward? Like what? Like you were just slowly revealing? <laughs> well, it's like those strip, strip tease games, you know, like if you, if you win that hand of, of blackjack or whatever, she takes her bra off. Oh yeah, like we used to play um, strip flip cup in college. This was strip podcasting, yeah. Okay. And, so, <laughs> and so it was, and the whole gimmick was like, guys, okay, yes, I'm a man, I have nipples. It's okay, like I, it's okay, I, I have my shirt off. And yet the conversation was totally serious. We talked, that was right after George Floyd was murdered. So we talked about police brutality and the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, you know qualified immunity and, and systemic racism, like all this really deep subjects, but I'm not wearing a shirt. And I had a, a stuffed, uh, sparkly narwhal, uh, stabby the narwhal on my shoulder. And, uh, and so people, a lot of people got very upset uh, who is Spike Cohen? Why is he doing this? He's making a joke of things. This is why libertarians don't win. I, I was why libertarians had never won before. Um, and so, you know, all this stuff happened. And what's happened slowly over time is that a lot of people 
They got that. I got their attention with it. I got that shock, you know, that jolt that I wanted to give. Everything moving forward now seems a lot, in contrast, is much more serious. Because now, instead of them giving me a hard time because I don't wear a suit and tie every time I'm on a, on a you know, podcast or a show, which would be inappropriate, it would look foolish. But instead of that, now they're saying, thank God he has his shirt on. So Yeah, that I'm a has, little upset that you didn't do this podcast shirtless. I've literally Spike. only done one shirtless show. I've been, I've been doing podcasts, including my own, for years now. I one time took my shirt off. One time, there have been a handful of times I had it kind of buttoned down a little bit. And I also, I think part of the problem is it is, it is chest hair envy. It is chest hair envy. Yeah, uh, not everybody a, can grow a full thing. A you know? full chest beard is yeah, what I have. And so, and so I do think it's also chest hair phobia, which is kind of chest hair envy. Those two things kind of go hand in hand. Some people um, are patchy. Me, I just wax my, all my chest hair off because mine is just so uneven. I just, you know, get oh, I think rid if, of it all. If I, if, I tried to, <laughs> if I tried to wax this, I think it would cause some kind of like neurological shock just from that much. <laughs> I mean, because all of my, it's all hair. And so, but anyway, so that's what that was. And so a lot of people, it's funny, people are still like, hey, you got your shirt on. I'm like, I always do. Just that one time I didn't. Um, but yeah, so that's what that was all about. And it really did kind of reset things because it's like, hey guys, it's okay that I had a shirt off at the beach. It's okay that I had a shirt off on a podcast. This is okay. Every, every president in the last 50 years, there's a picture of him without a shirt on. It's going to be okay. Really? Okay, good. And you're just trying to get that out of the way. I was right just at the getting beginning. it out of the way, right out of the way. Exactly. And you should, because being president ages you. So it's like, if, if I'm going to throw a shirtless pic of me, I'm going to do it right at the beginning, because if it's the middle at the end, like you're going to be weather beaten and stressed out. And I get it. Exactly. Well, hopefully it doesn't come to that. I mean, Joe Jorgensen is an absolutely incredible <laughs> candidate. She is running. She's the, the my presidential running mate. She is fantastic. And she now has she done any shirtless podcasts? Has, no, no, not she, Okay. No. And she won't be. She is an eminently serious woman. And, uh, and incredibly brilliant, a uh, self-made entrepreneur, um, and someone who's ready to lead from day one. She is also a senior lecturer on psychology. She's able to break down really complex ideas into ways that are relatable to everyday Americans and really break down how the Republicans and Democrats have utterly failed us and how common sense libertarian solutions are the way forward to fix those problems. They really have. They really have. Um, I was always, a, you know, I, th I think I still am and I, this is kind of embarrassing, but I think I still am a registered Democrat. Like I have to get on switching that. Uh, I've been meaning to for like a few years now, mm -hmm. but you know, you kind of just grow up like a normal kid in, into college and you're just like, Oh, two party system. And I, you know, I'd heard of libertarians, but I just was like, Oh, you hear that they're weird or, or even worse. You hear that they're super right wing. And uh, you know, I didn't even know any libertarians until I met Larry Sharp two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. My boyfriend's brother was working on his campaign for governor of New York. And mm -hmm. I met the guy and I was like, wow, he makes yep. more sense. He's friendlier. He's, he's more fun to be around. I can actually talk to this guy. And I never expected um, a politician to be somebody that was so accessible and friendly right. and like, and, you know, empathetic and really listened. So I was like, oh, wow. Like, and as I've grown up and my values have changed and like, I've been, working it's like oh i'm finding my values are, are more and more libertarian um so like what would you say to the person who uh, you know i guess really does believe in the two-party system but like how would you you know because if you say oh well everyone gets touchy about their party if you say if you're right. if, you see, if you say to a democrat the democrats have failed you you get uptight you get like oh those are my people i have to defend them and uh same thing with republicans so like mm -hmm. how would you try to or how are you and joe like how do you try to reach the people that are maybe disenfranchised maybe in the middle maybe just aren't sure mm -hmm. there's a better way so what a lot of what we get is what you were just saying well i'm a democrat and we're doing the right thing but more of what you're getting is yeah i'm not a hu huge fan of the democrats but they're way better than the republicans or you'll yeah. get on the Republican side. Yeah, you know, Republicans don't really represent me, but those Democrats are scary. I don't want them to win, so I vote Republican. And what's fun to do is you can say, well, what don't you like about the Democrats? Whatever they say, you can point out easily how Republicans do and say the same thing. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, well, I don't support them, but those Democrats. And I'll say, yeah, but the Republicans do it too. It doesn't matter who you vote for. You get the same thing. Uh, a quote I just heard on the last show that I was just on, Libertarian Counterpoint, uh, one of the hosts said, 
it doesn't matter who you vote for, the government still gets in. And mm. the Republicans and Democrats have had exclusive control of pretty much every lever of power, certainly at the federal level, for the better part of 160 some odd years. They've created this. They have exclusively worked together. They have created a system that shuts out all other options and tells you that in a nation of 350 million people, you have two options. Both of them suck, but you have to vote for one of them or the other one's going to get in. Right. And it's you're a shell referring game to and a like they created the Fed, right? Yep. And so how does that trickle down to like the average person who, who thinks, okay, well, I don't know, those guys don't affect my life. They're way up there and I'm way down here just working my job every day. You know, how, how would you explain how, how that's relevant to like the average person? You have to take them on the journey. So it, what matters is, and this is, and Leary's the template for this. Leary is all about, you, I love that you said empathetic. That is Leary's thing. Leary is empathy. Go to where they are from their precepts, listen to what they have to say. Instead of coming to them and saying, I know what your problem is, you haven't heard of my libertarian argument yet. Instead of doing that, because that's what we do. Libertarians tend to think that we can craft, if we could just craft this perfect argument and present it to the public, the public will go, this is the best argument I've ever heard. It is so logical. I am inundated with its logic. I'm now a libertarian. That's not how it works. People want to know what you're going to do for them. They want to know how you're going to benefit them. They feel like their vote is a vote for someone that's going to help them. What are you going to do to help them? And when we start trying to talk about self-ownership and non-aggression, it's not connecting. It's theoretical. That's it's like, theoretical. Yeah. It's this weird, yours, you sound like some kind of egghead. What are you doing? Larry, and, and I do as well, Larry reaches people where they are. He goes into their spaces from their precepts, listens to what they have to say, and then presents the libertarian solution to that. So yeah, he meets the, them where they are instead of trying they, to bring them to where he is. Exactly. He meet, Well, the goal is to bring them to where we are, but you have to meet them where they are first and not halfway. This isn't a negotiation. You're the one asking them for stuff. You have to meet them all the way where they are mm. in their spaces and from their precepts. So the way I get people to the Fed, which ultimately is how government is able to fund all these terrible things, you start with what they care about. If they care about healthcare, you talk about how government is destroying healthcare. First of all, you empathize with them on their situation. You don't try to tell them stuff like, well, you know, healthcare is not a right because they don't care about that. If they say healthcare is a right, just go with it and say, yes, you should be able to get the health care you need. You should be able to afford it. And it's terrible, the system we have. If they're most worried about systemic racism or police brutality, you, yeah. you reach them where they are on that. And you take them on the journey because at some point, when you've explained the breakdown of how government has created barriers and created a system to keep most of us down at our expense for the benefit of a hand, relative handful of well-heeled cronies who own everything, at some point, they're going to say, how do they get away with it? And that's when you answer it. The reason that they're able to do it is with the Federal Reserve. The American people would never agree to the kind of tax increases that it would take to directly pay for the American empire abroad, the prison industrial complex here, the militarized police state, the massive warrantless surveillance state, all of the things that are put in place, the occupational licensing laws, the regulatory burdens that are put on people trying to get ahead in life that essentially criminalizes poor people that are trying to get ahead uh, without, you know, doing it illegally. Once you, what, and, and we wouldn't agree to taxes to pay for that. So instead they have the federal reserve print right. out endless reams of money. And I know you're, I'm telling you something you already know, but no, you know, you're telling me lots of things I don't know. They, they, they have the federal reserve print out endless reams of trillions of dollars, which they immediately use to buy treasury bonds so that the government can pay for all this stuff. And what, all and this then, stuff meaning, the, the wars, the prisons, the, the police brutality, the militarized police state, the war on drugs, the massive uh, surveillance systems, uh, 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 the, the, uh, take, the, the cost of the takeover of healthcare, all of that stuff is financed by the Fed because we never agree to pay 80% tax rates to pay for it up front. So instead, they float it on the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve buys treasury bonds and we have to pay that back wow. with interest. 40-year bonds, every time they take out a new bond every day, that's a debt that we, our children, their children, and maybe even their children will be paying off with interest. And it's worse. It gets even worse because when they print out all that additional money and inflate the money supply even further with more Federal Reserve notes without any increase in actual value, 
that reduces the value of every single Federal Reserve note that we all have in our wallets and in our pockets and in our bank accounts and that we use to buy everything because we have to, because the government has made that a monopoly. They have monopolized the issuance and, and distribution of currency. So we have to use it to, to buy the things that we need and to pay each other and, and to reimburse each other. That's why the cost of living goes up every year. It's not because that's the nature of things. Back before the mm. Federal Reserve, the cost of living went up and down with supply and demand. The cost wow. of this would go up, the cost of this would go down. Generally speaking, the cost of living had a relative equilibrium. It might go up half a percent, 1% per year. 1913, the Federal Reserve is created. Two things start. First of all, or actually three things start. First of all, the government spends as much money as it wants because now it can have endless amounts of money lent, lent to it. Second thing that happens is now we have boom bust cycles. So they, the Fed feeds the uh, Wall Street. And then when Wall Street buckles, the Fed prints out more money to bail them out. The rest of us get stuck with the bill. So we have now we have boom bust cycles. And the other thing that happens is a constant and steady increase in the cost of living. The Federal Reserve note now is worth two cents on the dollar what it was in 1913. Imagine Jeez. if your money was worth 50 times more than it is now. That's why we're being left behind. I would That's have so many more plants on my fire escape. <laughs> <laughs> we would have everything. We would be so much better off. We would be in so much better of a situation. That's why there's a gap between the rich and the poor that keeps growing and growing. That's why income inequality goes, grows. That's why systemic racism is still in place. That's why police brutality is able to happen. And the militarized police state and the, the prison industrial complex where most states have a minimum quota of prisoners, you, the American people that have to be in their prisons at any given time wow. in order to keep their contracts with for-profit prison labor contractors that are on, on the stock market because they're that profitable in, in contracting slave labor. That's why that whole system exists because they can print out endless reserve notes to pay for it. If we ended the Fed, they'd have to come to us hat in hand and say, we got to raise your taxes for this. And we'd say, no, you're not going to raise our taxes. And they go, oh, well, I guess we're not going to have that. Okay, fine. We're not going to have that. That's so, why they created the Fed. So if our taxes don't go into the Fed, then, then where are they going? I mean, just, I so don't know. The Fed, so the Federal Reserve is a private, they call it a private bank. It's not private. I mean, it's private in that it's not technically owned by the government, but they only have one client. It's owned by like what, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers? Yeah, it gets, yeah. yeah, it's part of a central banking system that's owned by a small handful of people. But the Federal Reserve itself is an organization that's basically an extension of government. And it's a central bank that prints out endless money. Our taxes are going to pay interest paying interest on the treasury bonds that the Federal Reserve owns that when they bought the, the reserve bonds to lend to the government so that the government could pay for all this stuff, all these wars, all this uh, victimization of people and everything else. That's, that's what that system is created around. And, and again, it's the boom bust cycle. Here's how blatant it is what they did. 1913, the Federal Reserve was introduced. 1914, World War I. And we've been at war ever since. Wow. That is how blatant it was. They, all they needed was that central bank. All they needed was that one off from a central banking system that could just print out endless reams of money and it hasn't ended since. That was when, that was when the, uh, the, world, the, the world wars started that have never ended with World War I. That is when the prohibition that's never truly ended with uh, the alcohol prohibition. That's how every single bad thing that's happened. That's uh, shortly after that was when the National Firearms Act, when you know federal gun control was first introduced. All of the stuff that we've had started with the Fed because that's when they could afford to do it all to us without having to come to us and ask to raise our taxes for it. Wow. So if we if we didn't have the Fed, then like what would be in its place? Nothing would be. Would that mean we would go back to? Does this relate to the gold standard? Gold so the gold standard, currency. Yeah. So the gold standard was the way that the government used to control currency. And there's the gold standard is better than what we have now, but it has a flaw too because unless you find more gold, you can't increase the value of the money supply. I say much simpler: let the free market determine it. Because if you allow private comp competitors, if you allow voluntary competitors to compete to provide you with currencies, 
they have a vested interest in having that currency remain stable and actually gain value over time because they want you to use their currency. Imagine right. if you had pre competing currencies and this, you know, this cryptocurrency or this currency or whatever said, you know, we're gaining 15% a year. So imagine your cost of living going down, you know, a few percent every single year, just use our currency. And this one said, well, ours is going up 20% a year. So imagine your, your cost of living going down that much more if you go with us and they compete with each other because they have a vested interest in getting your business because they get a piece of it every time you use their currency as opposed to, to the system we have now, which is a monopoly that is imposed on us by government where they have a vested interest in it losing value over time. Wow. They want it to lose value because A, that means they can spend as much as they want. B, it means that the value of the debt that they have goes down because as the value of that money goes down, right. so too does the, the value of that debt relative to how much they can spend. But also they know it makes us increasingly desperate and reliant on them. So they have a perverse incentive to destroy our financial future. Whereas if you put it in the hand of competing providers, they have a, fine, a vested interest in making it the best currency possible. Right. So and then the market what, decides. Won't, the market it get, decides, exactly. Um, won't it get confusing to have multiple types of currency going on the, at the same time? The market will have an equilibrium. You know, we have multiple types of credit cards. You know, it, you can have as many types of credit cards as you want. For the most part, there's like four main ones, right? There's like Visa, MasterCard, Discover, really three main ones. And honestly, Discover is even a smaller one. It's really Visa and MasterCard and all their different subsidiaries. What you would end up with is you'd have a lot of different currencies and then there'd probably be like two, three, maybe four main ones. And those would also be international currencies. So then you wouldn't have the problems of like exchange rates and stuff like that because right. everyone would be using common currencies, not one world, new world order currency, competing private currencies that are voluntarily used because they're providing the best value. That is the way forward economically. It also solves the financial and social problems that are created by people just constantly losing that much more of their wealth every single year, but just a little bit, you know, just a little bit so that, you know, over time, so that, you know, three generations in you go, wait a second, why are we so poor? And it <laughs> just, it doesn't even register what's happening. Instead, moving towards where your money gains value over time and is more sound over time. And more important, and just as importantly, the government isn't able to fund its empire on your back anymore. Do you think this is something that could happen in a libertarian presidency? That is what Joe Jorgensen plans to do. She is plans this, on di okay. dismantling the system, dismantling the wars, dismantling the war on drugs, dismantling the, 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 the police to prison industrial complex, dismantling the, the militarized police state and, and healing the rift between the police and the public, which we could do an entire episode just on that. Oh, yeah. all, all the rifts that have been created by qualified immunity and civil asset forfeiture and uh, you know, the militarized, uh, uh, the military surplus program and all of this stuff. But the most important thing is then auditing and ending the Fed and replacing it with free market currency. When that happens, it doesn't come back. That also ends the cronyism because right now the billionaires, they know that if they want to be rich, they don't have to provide us with value. That's the loser's way to make money. <laughs> the real way to make money is to spend tens of millions of dollars putting your favored politicians in places of power. And you give them tens of millions and you get hundreds of billions and trillions back in the form of no bid contracts and taxpayer funded bailouts or actually federally reserve funded bailouts and uh, regulations put on the market to stop any smaller competitors from coming up and competing with you. That's where the real money is. So it creates a, a, a the centralization of that power and influence creates a perverse system of patronage where if you want to get ahead in life, you just go find, go buy some politicians. That's way better than providing the market. If you remove that system, now if they want to stay rich, they have to continuously innovate and provide better and better solutions to us, the consumer. And in a system where the consumer is king is a system where we all do better because everyone who wants to get wealthy have an immediate vested interest in serving us. Right. Just like with any other product. Like I don't, I'm always like, why are there 30 kinds of yogurt? You know, but <laughs> It's like when I was growing up, we had like maybe 10, I don't know, but it's like, you know what? Some people like yogurt and they deserve that, you know? But so, and here's the answer to that. As yogurt became more popular because of probiotics and, you know, keto diets and all this stuff, you know, the, it, the health benefits, all these providers jump in and go, well, I got the best yogurt. I've got Greek yogurt. I've got low fat yogurt. I've got this kind of yogurt. I've got lactose free yogurt. I've yeah. got nut yogurt or, you know, vegan yogurt or yogurt. whatever. Soy gurt. Soy gurt. I have soy gurt and <laughs> cashew gurt or whatever. And all the gurts. Yeah. They're all 
providing value. That's a perfect example. What an innocuous thing, yogurt, but because deodorant is another one. All these things is because we need them. There's a demand and here come the suppliers. And it might be frustrating sometimes that you got to pick from 15 different deodorants and yogurts, but that's why you get a good value. If the government was in charge, you'd get two yogurts. They'd cost a fortune and they'd be moldy. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. You know what like bums me out is like when I talk to my friends and and like I'll explain different like libertarian ideologies or even, you know, right like the the biggest goals of of like right. say like a Joe and you mm-hmm. um and and a lot of times like they'll say, "Well, I don't want to throw my vote away." Well, it's not really that sounds nice, but mm-hmm. I don't feel like it's going to count. It's uh I don't know. This to me sounds like something <laughs> either of the two parties made up, you know, like how oh, it can- is. Yeah, it absolutely is. And here's the thing. I'm sorry. What did I interrupt? Oh, you? I was just going to say like, I'm sure you're, you're met with that a lot. And, and like, what would you say to somebody who feels that it's, way? It's one of the main things I'm met with. And when people say, well, wouldn't I be throwing my vote away for you? I say, do the Republicans represent you? No. Do the Democrats represent you? Not really. Okay. Would it not be throwing your vote away to vote for someone who doesn't represent you, is responsible for every problem that we're facing right now, and who is yet again promising you that they're only they can fix it, even though they're the ones creating the problems and they haven't fixed it yet? That's throwing your vote away. Voting for the, you know, voting for uh, the same people who created the problem over and over again is a vote thrown away, and it's actually worse than that. Every single election cycle, we get diminishing returns. We get even worse options because if you keep buying into the lie that yes, these two options are terrible, but this option is slightly less terrible than this option. So you have to vote for this option or you're going to get this option. Every time those options become worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's what we're facing right now. Look at the people that they're putting up. Joe Biden and Donald Trump. These are two people who are emblematic of everything wrong in this country. Joe Biden, a career politician with his hands in every aspect of every terrible thing that's happening right now. And Donald Trump, a lifelong crony turned politician who has been cheerleading every terrible thing that we are seeing happen right now and is now in charge of it and and contributing to it as well. And then if we can put in front of them on that debate stage, Joe Jorgensen, brilliant woman, self-made entrepreneur, a woman who's ready to lead from day one, who will make these two look like fools. They can barely form a coherent sentence between the two of them, Mm -hmm. put her between them, breaking down calmly and kindly and empathetically and engagingly breaking down how these two and their parties have created the problems that we're facing and how common sense libertarian solutions are the way to fix those problems. And then of course you put me in between Mike Pence, who's still deciding if the government should be able to electrocute people for being gay, and oh, whoever ends up being, having the misfortune of being Joe Biden's running mate, probably Kamala Harris, who's best known for trying to execu- have a, a man executed who she knew was not guilty. I think he did pick her. Oh, has he already picked yeah, her? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, like Biden did pick Kamala Harris, right? Oh, did that yeah. happen today? I think, no? Nothing official? He, nothing official? Okay. All right. it's, it's, it's who, it's who they, it's who they're, they're, they're planning to pick in a right. time of police it's brutality, him. in a time of everyone protesting police brutality and over, over uh, prosecution of, of minority communities and marginalized communities. He's going to pick one of the most brutal prosecutors in recent memory, certainly in our time. And someone who actually, after a judge ordered her to release evidence that would exonerate a man that was facing a death row charge. Wow. An innocent man who Kamala Harris was trying to have executed for murder and who had evidence that she knew would prove he didn't do it, refused to release it even after a judge ordered her to do it. She tried to illegally do it. I would love to ask in front of the world watching on a debate stage, ask Kamala Harris how that isn't attempted murder. Yeah. And then, of course, go back to, you know, Mike Pence and say, do do you still think you should be shocking gay people? (laughs) Um, if you get Joe Jorgensen in the, on that debate stage with Donald Trump and Joe Biden, I think we win the thing. I think it'll be an emperor has no clothes moment. People will realize that all the nonsense they've been told that, oh, you got to pick Trump or you're going to get Biden. Right. Or you got to pick Biden or you're going to get Trump. And if you vote third party, it's a total waste. And they see what that third party is, who that candidate is, how much better she is than them, how much what more w- ready she is to lead than them. Right. I think what, we'll win that. What would it take to have that happen? So uh, in order to get on the, on the presidential debate stage, we have to get 15% or more in uh, five reputable opinion polls. So like Gallup, Emerson, New York Times, uh, Fox, 
uh, CNN, Quinnipiac, and those types of polls, um, you know, randomly selected uh, scientific polls. And we got close in 2016. Uh, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld in 2016 got 13% in one poll and 11% in another oh, poll. Wow. They, it's so close, right? They got so close. But what's happened during that time? Things have gotten worse. People are that much more open to a third party option. They picked someone who arguably is even worse than Hillary on the Democrat side. And now we've seen that Donald Trump was everything that we feared he would be. But here's another thing that's happened. The share of the media market that the dying mainstream media, the TV media has, yeah. has gone that much down, that much lower. And the share that the social media has that we are do much better on, that we have a much better constituency on is that much higher. And so I believe those things combined will close the gap where uh, Joe will be able to get 15% or more in those opinion polls. We have until shortly after Labor Day. So pretty much we have by the end of the summer to, to get her 15% or more in those opinion polls. I believe it'll happen. And when that okay, happens, good. it's yeah. all, all bets are off at that point. I believe we're going to win that. Have you guys been facing much censorship? Because I know a lot of my uh, friends, you know, have been dealing with a lot of censorship as far as social media goes. If they're just posting anything that's just going against like the liberal mob. Um, Not so and- much. We've been, we've been able to pretty, pretty much get everything out there. I, I think because we are actually like registered political candidates i think they're a little bit easier on us okay. uh, because they because that would be like an obvious like they're censoring political candidates type of thing well they but, were facebook admitted to this this uh this video with project veritas came out and i actually did uh interviewed them in a previous podcast um they had a guy uh you know he was like a whistleblower he was working at facebook and mm-hmm. he actually had like a body camera and he there was basically proof that people were deleting trump supporting posts like straight up because they were democrats and they were like yeah fuck trump and they were oh, wow you know, yeah it was really pretty nuts so i was it's good to hear that that's not that kind of thing is so not happening. yeah so far we haven't been seeing that here's what happens the more prominent we get, the more pushback we get, the, may, the more we're able to say, hey, listen, they're fighting us for a reason. Someone asked, me, yeah. someone asked me, you know, if we get elected, Congress obviously is going to immediately move to try to impeach us or to impeach, uh, you know, Joe. And what is our reaction? Good. If we will have built up enough of a groundswell in this country that we want an election and their tin-eared response, response is to try to remove us immediately for no reason – that's only going to blow up in their faces. And I'd yeah. say the same thing with any other attempt. You know, Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. We're right now in that, in that you know, ignore slash laugh phase, but that laugh's starting to get nervous. We've been putting out mm. viral videos that all of a sudden those laughs are starting to sound a little less laughy and a little more worried and concerned. And uh, so we expect the fight to happen. Um, no one can stop an idea whose time has come. And our idea, the time has come for libertarian ideas to fix these problems. Absolutely. I, re- I remember when Joe came out, when she like announced she was running, didn't she sort of like borrow the I'm with her hashtag briefly? No, so other, no, what happened was other people did it. So after oh. she got the nomination, <laughs> other people were saying, oh, I'm with her. I'm with her. And we flipped it around. We're like, no, 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 no. She's with us. Ooh, that's so, so much better. And so that's what we've been using. Some people are still using the I'm with her and you know, we can't stop people from doing that, but we're saying, no, 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 she's not Hillary. She's with us. She's she ran because she's with us. So that's been a real popular one. Um, that's way better. And yeah, definitely for the for the people out there who really just want to vote for a woman, like you have those votes too. Yeah, if that's your most important thing. Yeah. Here, here, not just a woman, but an accomplished self-made woman. Like this is someone who it, you know the the I guess the the prototype of someone who wants women's liberation. Here you go. Here is someone who has built herself up, serial entrepreneur, started multiple businesses, successful, you know, multi-million dollar businesses, is now a senior lecturer at a prestigious college. Like this, this is, you know, this is the, uh, this is the prototype for the successful self-made woman. Um, if that's, you know, if that's your, uh, you know, an important thing to you. And if it's not an important thing to you, she's just on her own merits, an, the, the, the best choice for president. She definitely has a very impressive resume for sure. And I, you know, yes. I know some folks, folks have seen like Berman Supreme, who I, I think you two were running together before you jumped in with Joe. Right. And then Berman Supreme, like he wears a boot on his head all the time. <laughs> and then they say you shirtless, you know, some people might think, <laughs> oh, we're not going to take the Libertarian Party so seriously because we got a guy with a boot on its head who wants to give away ponies. And then right. we have shirtless Spike. We have shirtless um, Spike. <laughs> 
So here's the thing, 40, something like around 40% of eligible voters don't vote. They don't participate in the system. They don't want to hear a thing from a politician because they recognize the system is designed. One time I didn't vote because I was going to be late for a yoga class. Well, and that's the thing. Not good. And, and, and the real reason there was it wasn't important to you. Like it was, it was the first thing that you would give up because was, you recognized. It was oh, the second Obama, um, the second time Obama was running. And I'm like, he's going to win. I'm in New York. I, you know, my back hurts. I got to get to you. And that's what we hear from people. It doesn't <laughs> matter who I vote for. Whoever gets in, it's not going to matter. They're all mm -hmm. liars anyway. Who cares? It's sad to hear. Mm -hmm. And so these are people that if we could show them libertarianism, they would join the party but they don't want to hear from anyone. They don't want to hear any politician. Someone like Vermin using a nonlinear satirical approach that he can get them because they're being entertained. They're seeing the nudge, nudge, wink, wink about how he's treating the system like the joke it should be treated like. And right. then he can bring them in and then they can find out about libertarianism. He has done an effective job at bringing a lot of people to the libertarian party and the movement. We are grateful for that. And we are grateful for Vermin in helping this campaign. Joe and I are running on a campaign to change that where the political discourse is not a joke anymore, where, where people are being taken seriously by, and, and not being treated as pawns in a cynical shell game between two people who are a whole, two groups who are holding hands and screwing everyone and creating a system that is cloistered around them and protects them and their favored cronies. And that's right. what we're running on. And, and you know, satire is one way to reach people. Serious messaging is one way to reach people. You know, edgy internet meme messaging is one way to reach people. We're not leaving yeah. a single chip on the table. Joe and I are running a campaign to reach every single American in this country. So, uh, so are you guys on TikTok then? I'm on TikTok, yes. I just, <laughs> I am on TikTok. I am on TikTok. I don't have a lot on TikTok. And there's actually a few unofficial Spike Cohen TikTok pages. Ooh, and they're putting okay. all sorts of fun, edgy stuff out there that I have no control over. Don't be tricked by page. the fake Spike TikToks. Don't be fixed. By, and one of them is actually real Spike Cohen. It's like, that's not Wow, they beat you too at Spike. Yeah, but, but reclaim it. <laughs> they, they beat me to it, but they're also putting out pretty cool stuff. It, it's okay, fully yeah. in support of me. It's just, it's very edgy, you know, kid, you know, it's, I, I believe someone in his early 20s who's just putting out like really edgy, uh, perfect for TikTok campaign stuff awesome. uh, for, for our campaign. So, so if you were like, I, I think about how I would explain to like a brand, brand new person who doesn't know anything about mm -hmm. the Libertarian Party. I would say, okay, well, generally they are socially liberal, right? And perhaps more fiscally conservative. Is there a better way? Like if someone is listening to this and they don't know anything about libertarians, like how would you in a kind of like easy way sum it, sum it up? So if we're talking, because there's two, when someone's asking what's the libertarian party about, there's two different things they might be asking. One is, what are they here for? How are they, how are they going to benefit me? Or how do I other, know if I'm yeah, a yeah, yeah. How, yeah, what How is voting for them going to be a good thing for me? Uh, which if you then get into, well, we're, we're liberal and conservative and what, it, it, you're kind of losing them because they're like, I, I wanted to know how they're going to help me. Um, and then the other way that they're asking is like, what are they about like philosophically? So if they ask the, you know, what are they about? How are you going to benefit me? I say, the libertarians recognize that the Republicans and Democrats have created this mess of a system that has left you completely behind, has left most of us completely behind to benefit a very small handful of very well-heeled, powerful people. And we seek to completely dismantle that and turn it around on its head where you are the one being served, where your needs are the ones being met, and where everyone has a financial and, 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 and has a vested interest in serving you and in which those cronies are torn down and brought to heel where they belong. Um, and that's a very powerful message. Um, if someone's asking philosophically what I believe, the, the, the elevator speech version I give is I say, you know, libertarians believe that you own yourself, which means that you own your life and your body. And that means you own your labor. And that means that you own the product of your labor, your property. All of these things belong to you. You enjoy the exclusive ownership and enjoyment of them. You can give them away as you wish. You can sell it as you wish. You can share it. You can lend it. You can do whatever you want with these things. Like if you had a farm, right, then like you wouldn't be controlled. It's does, your farm. Does that apply to farmers? Okay. It, it would apply to everyone. It applies to farmers because it is their sweat and toil that has led to them having this farm. Or someone gave it to them on their sweat and toil and had every right to hand it off to them. So now it belongs to them rightfully. So 
and that we believe and the reason that we and so we believe that any person trying to take from anyone else trying to harm anyone else or take their things is committing an act of aggression and that we believe aggression is wrong not just for moral reasons but also for utilitarian reasons it doesn't work if i can take from you and everyone else that's watching and listening to this uh if i can take from you whenever i see fit i'm not going to be a good steward of what I have. I'm not going to make good decisions with what I have because I can take more from you whenever I want to. And you don't you're value it. Steward, I don't value it and I can have more. It's unlimited money. I can have whatever I want because I can just take and take and take and take. And you're not going to be as good of a steward of what you have because I can come and take it from any moment. So you just go ahead and, and use it as, as you can while you still have it. And, and we recognize that all of the bad big government programs and policies that have come from the Republicrats is nothing more than a system whereby they have claimed the authority, the sole authority to take from all of us whenever they see fit. That's why their ideas lead to bad, inequitable, harmful, and abusive outcomes is because they're designed to. It's wow. designed to keep us down to, to their benefit and to keep us scared and unable and, and, and in a situation of not being able to actually get ahead to their direct benefit. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Spike, some people have called you an anarchist. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is appealing about the LP for anarchists? Well, anarchy is, in my mind, the logical conclusion of the idea that we own ourselves and that we should only engage with each other voluntarily. If that is the case, then ideally all things would be provided in a free market. Any service that's provided by government ideally could be provided in a free market. Now, with that being said, that's not what I'm running on. We are running on it, you know, and, and Larry, you know, you talked about Larry. Larry has talked about the fact that, you know, if he had his druthers, there would be no government and we'd all just be, you know, voluntarily interacting with each other. Larry, as much as anyone else, you know, running for office in New York, uh, uh, knows that we are nowhere near anarchy. We are no, right now the conversation is people arguing over whether we should be traveling towards ever growing tyranny at twice the speed of sound or three times the speed of sound. Mm. We need to be completely reversing the direction that things are going and moving it towards liberty. So we're not running on anarchy. We're running on ending the wars. We're running on ending the war on drugs. We're running on ending the, uh, ending the genocide in Yemen. We're running on ending systemic racism and police brutality. We're, we're running on ending the, the growing uh, uh, income inequality that's coming from government barriers to the, 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 those with the least among us to even try to get ahead in life through occupational licensing laws and other restrictions that make it nearly impossible for them to get ahead without engaging in illegal commerce. We, we, we're running on ending those things so that the bad, inequitable, and harmful policies of the Republicans and Democrats, policies that were put in place, whether for good or ill have been left in place precisely to harm us. So it's not even fair to say that they have failed us. This is going as intended. The way that wow. we are, are being treated is a feature and not a bug. And that libertarians are the ones with the solutions to end that. That's what we're running on. We are running on using common sense libertarian solutions to fix the problems that have been created by the Republicans and Democrats. We are running to draw, put a very clear line in the sand. On one side are those of us who are working to remove the boot from the neck of the people as they work to get ahead in life and to, uh, you know, to persevere and to fix the problems that, they, that have been imposed upon them by big government. And on the other side are the Republicans and Democrats and their cronies who are working to keep that boot on the neck of the people and, and even push it down even harder and to allow continued unnecessary needless suffering for no other reason than to preserve their own wealth and power and influence. That's what we're running on. And it sounds like you also would be interested in, you know, less, you know, meddling with other countries, like what we did with like Libya, oh, absolutely. Um, Syria, you know, just maybe just sort of, I don't know, butt out of that stuff. There's no, it has not been made better. The idea that we yeah. should bomb a country because they're bombing their own country. Cause we, that, cause we think that, that they're, that, I don't know. I, I just think it's not up to us to like judge like who, who is, who is democratic and who's not. I mean, I feel like the people of that place are going to know best. It's not. And that's also not why they're doing it. That's what they tell us. They tell us, Oh, we're going in to solve this, this regional problem. Or but really it's like a false flag. We're, we're going, it's, it is absolutely. It is. It's a lie. It's a cynical lie. And it's obvious because Every few years, we get another, you know, news dump. The last one was the Afghanistan papers, which showed that at every single point, the Pentagon knowingly fed false information to the media to make it look like things were going better there and in Iraq than they actually were. 
Jeez. And that should be no surprise to us because that's what happened with the Pentagon Papers during Vietnam. That's what happened with the paper releases during the Gulf War. At this point, it would be a shock if they didn't do that. Of yeah. course they do that. Every few years, we find out that whatever the new terror group is, sure enough, was par- at least partially created or funded, funded. or trained mm-hmm. or, or started by intelli- military, you know, U.S. intelligence services yeah. and our allies' intelligence services like Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS. ISIS and the rest, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, all of these things. We know this. And for us to even pretend that they're doing it for any other reason than to exert their control over the regions, to funnel money to their favorite contractors like Raytheon and Northrop Grunman and Boeing and Blackwater and the rest of them, to keep us scared so that we think there's a boogeyman that has to be stopped, which allows us to allow for more and continued infringements on our rights. Well, I don't like no-knock raids, but what if my neighbor's a terrorist? I guess they need to be able to do it. That's why they do it. It has nothing to do with protecting anyone or making anyone free or liberating anyone or anything like that. What are your thoughts about Chaz? Do you, do you think, number one, what are your feelings on Chaz? And mm-hmm. do you think Chaz is more anarchist or maybe more Marxist? It's really hard to tell right now. Um, now it's called Chop, which is- Chop! The cap- yeah, yeah. Now like it the went, salad. Oh, yeah, right, cho- like right. a Chop. Yeah, they're, 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 they're evolving. So they went from the Capitol Hill uh, autonomous zone, Chaz, to the- And then they Capitol realized Hill. they were not autonomous because they needed supplies. <laughs> well, and that, yeah, they weren't, they weren't autonomous. And, and, you know, it sounded like they were like, hey, man, I'm Chaz. But then also they cha- <laughs> now they changed it to the Capitol Hill occupied protest, which is probably more accurate. I am having a difficult time getting a good read on CHOP because I have people I greatly respect who have been there, who have completely different takes on what's going on. Uh, and I, many different people who have gone there and I have you know, reported back to me, you know, cause I'm saying what's going on. I need to be able to have an answer. And I'm hearing everything from this is the beginning of a peaceful revolution across the country to this is just a bunch of, you know, uh, this is just a bunch of, you know, bomb throwers who have taken over a, an area and are, you know, uh, manipulating everyone and, and, and uh, intimidating everyone and everything in between. So I really don't have to, good... I'm on drugs. <laughs> yeah. It's real. It's, it's a tough, yeah. it, we're, I'm getting, hearing everything in between. And so what I will say is that hopefully whatever hap- is happening there uh, is either happening peacefully or resolves peacefully. Uh, but in terms of the details, I'm just getting so much conflicting information. There's a true haze of, of war of what's going on there in terms of not really. There are so many different vested narratives about what's going on there that I think it's allowing people, people are allowing it to cloud how they're perceiving things there. Do you think they are entitled to be there or do you worry like, wow, they really are maybe plugging up some of these businesses that are within these blocks and kind of messing with the people who live there. It depends entirely on what's happening there. If if they're going in and you know setting up shop and and basically doing shakedowns, basically taking the role of what the the city does, uh, if it, you know with with their taxes and their and their police and everything else, if they're just you know look at the same boss, uh, same as the, as the old boss, I don't think that's a good thing, and and I don't think it's good. I, I don't support anyone intimidating anyone. If they're really just going in to to keep the police out and do this you know peaceful you know, this peaceful occupation and everyone's happy there, then I'm not sure I have a problem with that. So again, my out, my belief on what they're doing and whether it's good or not depends entirely on what's actually happening there. And where you and are. I, right. I, yeah. I I've just, seen videos of people like setting up, you know, different bouncers and people who act like cops, you know, there was this video I saw, there was this woman, she was like, oh, can anybody who's white, who's uh, had experience with security, like come deal with this? And it was funny because it was like, oh, it sounds like she is looking for a cop. Um, <laughs> but it just was like kind of hypocritical sounding. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all over the place. And I've seen where some, uh, there, I've seen stuff like that. I've seen where some uh, right wing groups like Proud Boys and others have tried to go in there and start a fight and have basically been shouted out. Um, so it's, it's, it's real. There's so, so many conflicting things that are happening there that I really don't have a good take on what's going on. And, mm-hmm. and I, 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 at least not a good enough take to give a, a solid opinion, especially since I'm running for office. Right. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. Um, yeah, I know that the videos are very entertaining to watch. Oh yeah. And to me, it just looks like, I don't know, it's just kind of like LARPing 
more than anything. There are certainly some LARPers there. <laughs> I, I have, I suspect that it's probably a combination of things. There are people that are doing great things, peaceful things that are trying to create an, you know, an amazing thing to move forward from. And there are some people in there to be, you know, violent jerks. And there are some people that are just LARPing and it's probably a combination of things happening there. Yeah. I was like, didn't I see a lot of you guys at the Renaissance fair last year? <laughs> <laughs> Um, interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah, it must kind of take the, it, do you feel like the pressure's off? Like, okay, you're not running for president. You're running for vice president. It's, um, I don't know. Does it feel any less like there's less pressure on you? Well, I was way? never running for president, so I don't know what that pressure's like. I've always right, been. Right, right. You've never done that. Right. But, um, I don't know. I, the pressure obviously is, is much higher than it was when I was just running for the nomination. Um, obviously people look to the top of the ticket. So I'm sure there's way more pressure on Joe than on me. Um, do I think I, there's probably more pressure on, there's obviously more pressure on Joe than on me, but I, I, I don't see it as a, I guess because I don't have that reference of what it would be like running at the top of the ticket. I can't That's tell true. you. I know yeah. that the stakes have just slowly gotten higher as I've been going on, but I've also got a really co a, a competent and growing team under me. That's making it easier for me to just focus on this kind of stuff and not have to worry about the back end stuff. Um, so no, I'd say I, this has been my dream. I wanted to use this run to leverage it, to spread the message of Liberty far and wide and try our best to win the election at this level. And then also, you know, cause the more votes we get, whether we win or not, the more, you know, the better we do with the down ballot races and to just kind of help in a grassroots way, grow the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian movement on all fronts. And I've had, you know, a growing number of opportunities to do that. And I'm, I'm loving every second of it. You mentioned a lot of issues that um, your and Joe's campaign are, are going to focus on. But what would you say if you could pick like maybe the top two or three that you would be most that you think you guys are going to most focus on? Uh, I, I, I I hesitate to do that. I, I guess the three top ones would be end the war on drugs, um, get government out of healthcare so we can actually afford healthcare. Um, and then I'm not sure, I, I, it would be a tie between ending police brutality and, and ending the militarization of the police and ending the wars in the military industrial complex. The thing is, it's hard for me because it's such a holistic thing where really all of them feed into each other. I, yeah. It's hard to really like pick two or three things, but I guess those would be the top four things. What would a better healthcare system look like or what? How, how could we get there? It would look like a system in which pharmaceutical companies couldn't hide behind patent protections and jack up the price of their drugs a hundred fold or a thousand fold. And where when they want to create new drugs, they wouldn't be able to use the FDA to force us, the taxpayer, to pay for the research and development and testing of those drugs that yeah. they then get to profit off of for decades and get indemnified against any potential lawsuits in, as a result. It would look like an end of that. It would look like an end of the, the, the system of patronage where the insurance companies have completely taken over the healthcare industry to the point where they're actually mandated in most states now and were mandated federally for quite a while as well. Uh, and, in which the, uh, and in which the cost of healthcare, 75% uh, 75, 75 of healthcare costs would no longer be driven up by the... So right now, 75% of the cost of healthcare is just Medicare, Medicaid, and insurance uh, regulations and red tape mandated by federal and state governments. Wow. 75%. That's before you get into pharmaceutical companies jacking up the prices. That's before you get into uh, you know, laws that say that you can't buy pharmaceuticals in other countries where it's cheaper and bring them back here, even though it's legal there and it's legal here, but crossing a line is not legal with it. Um, ending, ending those things drastically ending a certificate of need laws where uh, hospitals have to scrape and beg uh, in order to be able to build a new hospital in a region for no good reason. Well, there's one good reason because the providers that are already in that region don't want to have a new competitor. That's why wow. that rule is in place. All of that ends government, federal government gets out of healthcare, which necessarily reduces the cost of health here because now instead of pricing being decided by major healthcare provision companies and pharmaceutical companies and uh, the government and Medicare and Medicaid actuarials and insurance companies. Now the cost of healthcare is being decided by the consumer and the provider. And that's it. So mm -hmm. that, that, that's how you get, you get government out of healthcare, the pricing goes down naturally. 
Well, that sounds good. I hope it's doable. Yeah, I hope that people take away, you know, if nothing else, that voting for the Libertarian Party is not just throwing away your vote. Because guess what? If enough people throw away their votes, then we can have like real change. If we know? don't win. Throwing it away into something better. If yeah. we don't win and we get second place, I will enjoy the opportunity to say, hey, you know, you know, like, let's say that the Republicans came in, in third going, hey, listen, we could have won this thing if that were, if Trump hadn't stolen so many votes from us. But no, I, I the, right. the, yeah, the, the, the fallacy of the wasted vote is just that. And it's easy to say to people, do you like your options? No. Well, then why are you throwing your vote away for them? Exactly. That's it. Spike, are you married or seeing anybody? I'm curious to see how all this is affecting your, your personal life. This I am married. My, I've been okay. married to my lovely wife for, uh, we had our anniversary, our 10th anniversary back in March. Aww. And uh, we've been together for almost 13 years. And uh, we've done pretty well. I mean, I, my, my, uh, my manager and my team make sure that I have, lot, I have you know, a certain amount of what they call it on, my, on the calendar. It's called spike time. Oh, and, uh, spike time. And it's just time that I can spend with my wife and my dog and, you know, and just enjoying life. It's, it's not a lot. I mean, it's mostly sleep and a couple of additional hours and, you know, eating and stuff like that. But to make sure that I'm still connecting with my wife, that I'm still connecting with my family and I'm still have a, you know, I'm obviously more busy than I've ever been before, but still having that time carved aside to be able to spend time with family. So, so far we've been doing well. Uh, also it's, it's, you know, it's easy to be able to say to my wife, Hey, would you like to fly to Orlando and then to, you know, Vegas and, and all that stuff. So, I mean, there's, there's that aspect to it too. Uh, she is definitely my biggest supporter and, uh, but we, we've done well. We're, we're, we're trying, we're being cognizant of the fact that this could easily turn into a, a strain if we aren't cognizant of it and recognizing it and making sure to put our relationship first. Yeah. Yeah. That can so easily you know, cause, cause it's probably way more work and more. It know, is a lot of work. It's, marriage is a lot of work in general. Oh, yeah. th this, this adds a, a layer of difficulty, but I also have a really great team that's making sure that our, you know, m my personal health, the personal health of our team and our relationships matter, uh, you know, are, are being put forward because if we do all of this and then, you know, lose what matters to us, what, what our lives were built around, what we were doing all this fighting for in the first place, then what did we profit? So, yeah. You need spike time. We need spike time. Hashtag make spike time great again. Or maybe if you you could have your own TV channel and call it Spike TV. It oh, spike wait, time. never mind. <laughs> That's well, already. they they don't call it that anymore. So I guess I could call it that. Oh, they don't? God, I need to. Yeah, no. I need to get with it. Um, <laughs> spike, if people want to learn more about you and um, your party and, and all about the issues that you care about, where can they go, you know, where can people follow you other than the plugs that you, uh, the handles that you have here, where should people go to learn more? So if, uh, if you like what you heard, you want to find out more, you want to join the team, you want to volunteer, you want to help. Uh, our website is joej2020.com. That's J O J two zero two zero dot com. Uh, we have a, a volunteer form on there that you can fill out to join our team. We have a big donate button. We would love any contribution you're able to give. Um, if you're able to join the Jorgensen, the Joe Jorgensen Spike Cohen uh, Facebook group, and we're, we're 60,000 strong and growing by about 10 oh, to wow. 20,000 a week. Yeah, that's it's amazing. grown crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's exponentially growing. That's the Facebook um, group? That's a Facebook group. It's called wow. Joe Jorgensen Spike Cohen for President and Vice President. If you type in Joe Jorgensen Spike Cohen, you'll find it. It's huge. Um, so you can join that. Uh, if you want to join the Libertarian Party, um, lp.org slash join. Uh, and then if you look up your state and, and, and local Libertarian Party affiliates, most of them are either free to join or very cheap, like $5, uh, $5 pledge. Um, that's where most of the campaigning is going to be happening at the grassroots level. Uh, but yeah, if you'd like to join us, joej2020.com. And uh, we would greatly appreciate if you want to sign up and be a volunteer. And we would greatly appreciate any, any donation or contribution that you're able to give. Sounds thank good. You. Spike, thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Chrissy. Of course, really of course. It. Anytime. <laughs> Bye. Bye.